feeling? Last session before the cocktail. <laughs> Start the clock. Right? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, thrilled to be here. I'm here with two uh, expert uh, executives who know more about investing and delivering returns. Uh, they will forget more than I'll learn, uh, Owen and, and Marit. We're very excited to have a discussion with you guys about some of my favorite things, sustainability and investing, sustainable investing, action, less talk, but we're going to talk, give me a little bit of talk. Uh, when Owen invited me to be a part of this, he said, just come and be part of a panel, I'll be a few of my friends. <laughs> so many people. <laughs> I feel like I, I have a suspenders and a belt with my iPad and my notes, but we'll be okay. Um, we're going to talk about mobilizing capital to address a very urgent and real challenge, uh, which is uh, the, oper the challenge of climate change and the challenge of uh, uh, making sure that we can have sustainable investing and returns that deliver uh, capital in, in the right ways. In one of our pre-discussions, we were chatting about what we wanted to cover today, and in the discussion, the theme of being on the edge uh, became very apparent. Uh, the theme of being on the edge of real and urgent environmental disaster uh, was, was apparent in the conversation. I think this room is probably very like-minded in that. If we need a reminder, we just look to either coast of, of Canada and see that uh, happening in real time. Uh, we had a discussion around being on the edge of, of opportunity, uh, knowing that there, are, uh, there is a, a, a higher level of opportunity of early stage op companies, of early stage innovation in Canada than there is available capital. And so how do we close that gap? Um, and also being on the, the, the edge of, of solutions that, uh, that if we can convene and create a space for things to come and build an ecosystem that's really relevant, uh, we can probably move, move the dial uh, on a number of indices for a number of different stakeholders. So I, I know I'm excited to, to have you two give us some, some perspective on that. Um, just to ground us in the conversation, I think what we want to do today is cover um, sort of three areas of the question uh, from, from my perspective, and I think they'll, they'll, they, our investment colleagues will give us some, some perspective on this. Um, I think there is a big question of the why. As we look around the marketplace, as we look around incentives, as we look around the opportunity, I do think we have to tackle the why around the urgency and why we ought to stay committed to addressing that challenge in, in the immediate term. Uh, many of us have been involved in politics and policy, and we often hear that juxtaposition of urgent and important, and how do you find the urgently important in that why. Uh, I'm going to ask the panel at the appropriate time, and I think it's a question we should all be reflecting on, uh, is to solve for the where. If this is truly a global problem, if this is truly a, an international problem, I think we've got to ask ourselves how we enhance the value proposition of the Canadian ecosystem as a marketplace. And then of course, as the theme of this conference and the theme of this session calls us to the tackle, we've got to talk about the how. Less talk, more action. I'm gonna make a button with that on it. Do you guys want one? Less talk, that was a joke, you're all meant to laugh. Uh -huh. no? Okay. <laughs> all right, some context on, on, on where I sit. You know, I work at Great West Life in Canada Life Co. I'm part of the power ecosystem. And I say that up front because I'm part of a business that deals with uh, life insurance and long tail assets and long term liabilities. So I just put that out as a preference around the urgency. But we partner with expert asset managers like Power Sustainable that, that look at some of the more immediate opportunity. And so we're, we they sort of have two sides of the perspectives there. I will say that at Canada Life, we have committed to a number of different climate strategies. We've leveraged the expertise on the front line from our colleagues at Sustainable and other parts of our business, business lines. Uh, last year, we committed $127 billion uh, around strategies that vary uh, from wind, solar, and hydroelectric projects. So we're starting to get serious about this. We're starting to introduce new lenses in the way we evaluate opportunity. Um, but I, we are at the early stages of this in, in the Canadian marketplace, and we're beginning to stand up some cap capabilities in the U.S. and in Europe as well. Uh, you can see in the, U U the U.K., we've announced some transition strategies, so we're looking to announce some uh, in this market soon, so stay tuned. No breaking news in this session, but, mm. but soon. Um, and also looking to introduce some evidence-based metrics and KPIs and how we deliver returns there. So that's, that's just to ground sort of where, where I'm coming from. Um, I'll go to maybe Owen, just to ground us in your perspective and your starting point. I'll come to you, Marit, and then maybe I'll ask the first question. Thanks very much, David. It's great to be here. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. It's an exciting time to be talking about sustainable investing particularly here in Montreal. Uh, I'm sure everyone saw the announcement this morning of Investique putting a billion dollars into local Quebec-based sustainable investing firms. It's fantastic to see hubs developing for sustainable investing. 
Uh, because let's not kid around. The challenge ahead of us is monumental. Uh, I mean, David put that interesting phrase on, on the edge. I think that's exactly right. Um, it, it cuts both ways. You know, we're on the edge of, uh, of a climate precipice, but we're also on the edge of phenomenal breakthroughs across different industry sectors, across different investment opportunities. Um, Power Sustainable was set up about four years ago by Power Corporation, a Montreal-based financial holding company. And the idea was to build a sustainability-focused investment firm that would be present in every asset class relevant to high performance and high impact for sustainability and particularly climate change. Um, we're gradually building that firm. So we've got about $4 billion under management today. And we're, we're coming down that sort of, uh, we're coming down the capital stack, if you like. So some of our first investments were in core infrastructure. This year, we expect to launch infrastructure debt. Uh, and we're also planning, indeed, working with our partners here at the EDC to tackle growth equity investments, particularly in Canada, where we see a huge opportunity. But the, real, the reason or the, the, the underlying kind of philosophy of something like Power Sustainable uh, comes to another really important point. Um, and maybe, maybe I'll, I'll introduce three kind of words that if folks want to kind of take three things away from this discussion, maybe they take these three. One is this idea of being on the edge, uh, upside and downside. The second one is the idea of scale. Uh, there's a missing concept of scale. People aren't sure about scale. You talk about climate change, and people don't know what the scale means. They don't know what it means when it comes to, to degrees Celsius. Oh, it's only one or two degrees. I mean, I, I like a day that's one or two degrees warmer. How bad can that be? <laughs> I'll put it like this. You know, we're on track for probably three or four degrees as a planet. The last ice age was one or two degrees colder on average than it is now. So that maybe just sets the scene for what three or four could look like. Um, but scale has another meaning, scale in, in capital markets. Um, and it comes back to the reason Power Sustainable was created. Our mission is to bring scale up capital uh, to these climate change investment opportunities. Um, globally, there's no shortage, funnily enough, there's no shortage of great ideas. In some sectors, we're well beyond the ideas. We know what the technologies are. It's just a matter of scaling up the investment, scaling up the deployment, uh, getting from carbon intensive uh, power production, for example, to zero carbon power production. And in industry after industry, that challenge is, is being undertaken. But there's a gap. There's a gap between the very early stage ideation, which, by the way, we here in Canada are no slouches at, in particular here in Montreal, um, and later stage commercialization, maturation, getting to the level where you really start to have an impact uh, across markets. And, and that's where there's a gap, N- not just here in Canada. Obviously, this is a global gap. It's maybe particularly strong here where we have a lot of the early stage ideas, but they're not getting through to, to, to the far side. There's no shortage of capital available for fully direct, de-risked ideas. Uh, the banks are happy to lend. There are infrastructure funds and indeed pension funds that will gladly put money to work for six, seven, eight percent, or maybe in this environment, 10%. Uh, once the idea is fully de-risked and there's long-term visibility on the revenues, but there's a gap there between that early stage risk-taking of venture capital and later stage fully de-risked. And that's very, very interesting, but you really have to talk about scale capital. Big picture, the opportunity or the, the challenge looks something like, as a planet, we're investing 500 billion per year today, roughly, in decarbonization across the grid, mobility, buildings, uh, agri-food, materials, and we probably need to be investing something like 10 to 20% of that. To, sorry, 10 to 20 times that. So 5 to 10 trillion per year if we're serious about full decarbonization in a 2030, 2050 kind of time frame. Um, the final idea, so being on the edge is one, scale is another. But the last concept is just this idea of an ecosystem and unusual partnerships. And I'll say less about that because I think that's an idea that Marie will probably talk about as well. But it's going to take a village, or it's going to take a couple of villages, because the, the small companies that are trying to get breakthroughs up and down their supply chain in ecosystems that aren't used to this kind of fundamental change, they're not going to get there with, with, with bigger checks. They're going to need advice, they're going to need networks, they're going to need uh, a lot more uh, than just capital to really break through and change our economies, change our societies. We'll come back to that concept, but maybe I'll just leave you with those three, three ideas. You read? Wow. 
How do you follow Owen and his three ideas at last last uh, session of the afternoon? Um, so, so maybe um, let, let me just talk a little bit about EDC and thank you on for the invite for being here and for the partnership. Um, so EDC is Canada's export credit agency and immediately you're going, mm, this is interesting at a sustainable <laughs> finance conference. Um, but we represent the Canadian economy. We're here to support all Canadian exporters in their journey, whatever that might look like. And of course, that journey today, as Owen described and David described, is a journey of both opportunity and challenge. So how do we help Canadian companies seize the opportunity that is presented with climate action today, or in fact, all the elements of ESG that we need to take into consideration. And equally, how do we help them understand what it means to their business and what they need to do in the core of their business to continue to be able to trade internationally. So, so that's what we do. Um, we do it in many, many different ways. We equally agree with the climate imperative and the need to take action. And we need to be able to do that to support Canadian companies. So for us, this is this is as much a climate imperative as an economic imperative for Canada. How do we actually help transition the Canadian economy so that we all enjoy the benefits that we've enjoyed so far with the growth of the Canadian economy and being one of the G7, G20, and an OECD country? So how do we continue with that success and equally deal with one of the biggest challenges of our time. So so that's where we are orienting ourselves. I know you've got lots of questions for us coming up around how we're going to do that. So trust me, it's not all talk, even though <laughs> I've just uh, give you a very big description. It's a lot more about action, yeah. a lot more about partnership. And I think you're right. The word for me today is ecosystem because none of us in this room are going to be able to do this on our own. So it's how do we find like-minded individuals? How do we even find the ones that aren't like-minded and ensure that they're starting to turn their mind to what is both an opportunity and challenge? Yeah. That's a really good uh, comment to, to put out there. You know, in the old world, we often thought about, yeah, you know, how do you convince the unconvinced in order to move the problem? It's almost as though we need to raise the volume of the convinced in a credible evidence-based way with, with the fact pad or the fact set that Owen points to around returns and the opportunity to pull the bell curve. Uh, are you both Irish? Yes, we are. Oh my God, I feel so left out. <laughs> my goodness. So if you thought this session was ending in 45 <laughs> minutes, it's not going to be, it's going to take a bit Break longer. Break out the drink, let's bring it in. Um, we spend a lot of time in Ireland in our business. We have a, a great Irish business, we love it. Owen, um, I had sort of pegged four to six trillion in needed investment. You're saying five to 10, uh, that's a delta. Um, uh, we're orders of magnitude from that based on your comments. Um, and, and Mary just outlined a series of challenges in, uh, in, in, in getting there. So to both of you, um, how do you address in your organization, um, given the, the mandates you just outlined, that uh, financing to action gap? Like, how, like what's, the, what's the formula that's working for you and what insights might we want to lend to, to the room? You want? Sure. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, I, if it was a formula, it would be easy. Um, that's maybe where we should start this conversation. I think it's as much an evolution as it is a revolution. Um, and certainly when I look at uh, EDC and recognizing the journey that we've been on, you know, for the last 10, 11 years, we've had clean technology as one of our priority sectors and one of the areas that we really wanted to overinvest in. Um, so that's 11 years. That's not, you know, yesterday that we just suddenly decided that we were going to look at that. But when I look at the, the evolution that we've come through, I think other than having positive discrimination to clean technology as a sector, we were continuing on our journey of supporting all sectors and with no either positive or negative discrimination. And I think it was really only in 2017, 2018, when we started to create our own climate policy, that we recognized the responsibility that we have to Canadian companies to actually lead for, and lead by setting, being very clear about where we see the opportunities and the challenges and putting in place either the products 
or the tool set that might help Canadian companies do that. Now, to be able to do that, we're a financial institution, so we've got to look at ourselves first. We had to look at our portfolio. We had to say, what is it that we actually need to reduce our participation in? Where is it that we want to over-invest in? So very positive discrimination, perhaps, uh, to be really clear about getting that. And then how do we actually tool ourselves up? You know, how do we get the methodologies, the data, the understanding of our customers uh, coming along with us? And, and it really has been a journey. So 2019, we issued our, our climate policy, our standalone climate policy for the first time. 2020, we committed to net zero, sorry, 2021. 2022, we announced our science-based targets and, and how we're going to do that for 20, and interim targets for 2030. That's all progressing. And still today, there are sectors that we work in and um, that don't have science-based target methodologies that yeah. we can actually follow. And we recognize that the standards are continuing to evolve. So it's as, as much as finding some of the elements that you absolutely can work on and understanding where the others are going so that you can be there. And we need to be able to do that for ourselves as a financial institution with a portfolio and then actually encourage Canadian companies to go down the same path. So. So I, th I think there's many different elements to this. There's cultural elements. How do you get your team to understand that you cannot think of investing or financing or insurance the same way you did five years ago, it's the same way as we did in 2022? Two, for example, yeah. like the, your comment about uh, climate events. I mean, that in itself, the speed at which we've seen those uh, since 2000 or since 2020, even a pandemic are really challenging us that the world is changing faster than our policies are actually keeping up with. So, so I think you've got to be very much looking forward to where things are going and you've got to be You've got to be actioning in your systems, your processes, your policies, and in the culture of your people so that they're coming along with you. So I think that's probably the most important thing. Owen? Uh, I, I, look, I agree with Mairead's approach. I think it's it's really important to take it step by step and build on your build on your foundations. I mean, we were fortunate at Paris Sustainable to come to it almost not, not quite a clean sheet. Power off its balance sheet had made several pretty good investments in companies like Lion Electric here based here in Montreal, uh, in wind, solar, hydro um, in, in Canada and the United States. So we inherited some of those portfolios, but overall we came to the opportunity uh, with a pretty open mind. And our approach was to say, you know, we're not worried about investment returns. We think if you can bring some of the solutions to these challenges, you'll make plenty of money. Um, our approach was to say, look, there, there are four, I like to call them the four horsemen of the climate apocalypse. Oh. There are four big challenges that this planet has to tackle. Uh, and it's a different approach needed in each of the four, you know, and so we've calibrated our different investment platforms to go after those challenges. And it's a different scale of capital uh, in each one. So let's talk about the grid. Let's talk about power supply. Let's talk about power demand. Let's talk about our urban environment, our built environment. That's one big, big source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's probably 30, 40%, maybe closer to 40% if you include the urban environment. Um, and funnily enough, we know exactly what needs to happen. It's not a mystery. Solar, wind, batteries are basically in the money or close to being in the money. It's a question of scale, dramatically, dramatically, dramatically scaling up that capital. I mean, there are many, many uh, states and provinces, uh, even just in North America, one of the richest regions on the planet, still burning coal and, and, and fossil fuels to generate power. Uh, that, that's not required. We have better technologies. It's a question of rolling them out and displacing the, um, the uh, carbon intensive forms with, uh, with, with uh, zero carbon forms. But we know what has to be done. And so there it's a question of project finance, a question of infrastructure investment, a, a question of scale up. There's been a lot of scale up already. I mean, here in Canada, we've seen it. We're lucky enough in Quebec to be pioneers on clean energy starting from the 1960s and, and the amazing uh, development of, of Quebec's hydro potential, uh, which hopefully has a lot more to go. Uh, but it could be so much bigger. In mobility, you've got a different challenge. And that's another 30% of, of, of GHG emissions. Uh, 
anybody in this room who's not going to walk, cycle or take public transport uh, back home is probably going to be getting in a plane or, or, or driving a car or hopping in a bus. Um, maybe some of those are electric, I hope they are, or hopping in a boat, maybe, who knows. Uh, but those are tough things to decarbonize. Uh, electric vehicles are expensive. I mean, we can afford them more or less here in North America, but in China and India, they're still very expensive. So there's a bit of a road to go when it comes to decarbonizing transportation, de decarbonizing mobility beyond, uh, call it light transportation, decarbonizing buses and trucks. That's another level of, of challenge. Decarbonizing planes and boats. Oh boy. The good news is there's, there's technologies coming. There's the whole hydrogen e ecosystem. There's sustainable fuels of different forms. So there are really, really good technologies. Some of them are, are by the way, out of the lab. They are ready for commercial scale-up. But you take a different approach to, those, to that sector than you would in infrastructure, where it's really about getting from hundreds of billions to, to, to trillions. Here, it's maybe taking things from, from the sort of VC universe, to speak the language of investment, to growth equity, private equity. And, and look, maybe down the road, we will have infrastructure. Some people are starting to look at certainly hydrogen charging stations as, as infrastructure. And it probably will be something that people will be happy to earn sub 10% returns on over the next five, 10 years. And the last two are very interesting. So these are what I call the, the kind of really hard to decarbonize sectors. Uh, Agri-food and industrial. Um, Agri-food is a really, uh, really unique sector with really unique challenges and one where in so many ways humanity's relationship with, with the natural environment is broken. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions is one, but it goes beyond that. Our relationship with, 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 with land, generally speaking, uh, has a long way to travel and with food generally. We have a really good team that we brought on board last year focused on agri-food growth equity. So the smaller companies that are trying to tackle this space, who are ready for that leap to broader commercialization in areas like uh, mainstreaming organic, uh, particularly tackling things like logistics, in areas like food waste, in areas like vertical farming. Those are the kind of opportunities that I think are ready to go mainstream. Um, and last but not least, the fairly um, wide ranging field that we, I'll call industrial, but it's literally, it's everything else. A lot of emissions there that are really hard to get rid of, including things like materials plastic, uh, pulp and paper, mm -hmm. cement, steel, uh, things that have been really, really tough to decarbonize that release CO2, not just in their energy use, but even through the industrial processes themselves. Um, but there again, we see opportunities, you know, that's, that's probably a more of a growth equity, private equity style, style approach. Obviously there's a lot of venture capital in these areas too, but we don't think that's where the gap is. We think it's at the scale up side. Um, we haven't, we've done one-off investments there, We'd love to have a strategy focused on those opportunities, and that's something we're actively working on. So let me challenge you on, uh, on, on that front with the where question in Canada. Most of what you described is opportunity that should be agnostic to geography. So I'd, I'd ask both of you to make the case that that opportunity should be um, uh, patriated, that should, there's a domestic opportunity there. And then what, what, what are the barriers? I mean, I, th I think someone said five times the startup, uh, and so the size of the startup environment in um, decarbonization exists in Canada from a startup perspective, but there's just no capital either flowing into Canada or within Canada. So what, why here and, and, and what do you, why do you see it no one else? So uh, why here? I think it's really, that's actually not a difficult question to answer when we look at the Canadian ecosystem. You know, we have a natural resource base in Canada that actually has given us a lot of talent that in what Owen would describe, particularly in the industrial sector, that has meant that it has created an industry where we lead in clean technology companies. Com you know, companies recognize green is green. And, you know, whilst in the past it might be called efficiency and efficient use of resources, now the understanding is that efficient use of resources is actually a positive to climate action overall. So Canada has built an ecosystem of startups, of interesting technologies that can go to the world. You're right, this is a global problem, but why can't Canada help solve that problem? problem. In fact, you know, not only should we want to solve the problem, I think we need to solve the problem. So we need to help our Canadian companies scale so that they can go and take on other markets in the world that actually are not as uh, are not as sophisticated. So we've got this great engineering talent. Montreal's a great example of it. There's a reason when you build these clusters 
of talent like engineering that you can then harness that to create a, a cluster like AI. So why can't we use the cluster now that exists in Montreal on AI to actually help solve some of these climate problems as well? So, so I see in Canada a large number of companies that can help solve the problem. At EDC, you know, I said that we've been in this space for 11, 12 years. We, we still remain one of the largest financiers of clean tech companies in Canada. I'm actually a bit disappointed about that. I'm proud of my team for doing it, but it still means people don't see the opportunity, even with all these imperatives that are there. So, you know, we're, we facilitated about 8.8 .8 billion in business last year in our clean technology book. Um, that has to increase and we've given the team much more targets to try and help that because again we see the opportunities you look at our natural resources you know hydrogen as an example you look at the industrial processes you have you look at our oil and gas industry you look at that for carbon capture utilization and storage you look at it what that base will actually allow us to do why shouldn't we be part of this opportunity globally um, no, I can certainly go into barriers, but maybe Owen, did you want to jump in on opportunities? <laughs> sure, happy to do, happy to do that, Marie. Um, I think you're you're spot on. Look, why Canada? Um, it, it's a it's a good question to ask, but I think if you pause on it, it, it is also an obvious an obvious one. Not just because we all live here, um, or at least I'm sure most of the attendees um, must live here. Um, but taking a step back, Canada's in a natural spot to be part of the solution. As much, by the way, and let's be honest about it, Canada's also part of the, the problem. It's one of the highest per capita emitters uh, uh, in, in the world. Um, and that's because of Canada's um, gargantuan um, land footprint. You know, whatever it is, 5 or 10% of the Earth's surface is Canada. So oil and gas, we, we have it. We also have um, a huge uh, uh, forest and uh, metal resources all of which would be absolutely vital for an electrification revolution yeah. and for a green energy revolution. Um, so Canada, like it or not, even if we do nothing, we're going to be playing a role just by selling copper and lithium. Um, but of course, we could do a lot more than that. I'm right. absolutely correct in pointing out the other astonishing resource that Canada has, and that's, of course, the people and the ideas uh, in, in Canada. Um, if you look at BCG, are very smart. They've come up with a, a, an index to measure the intensity of climate related startups in a country. And so if the United States is one and Scandinavia is, is sort of 11, Canada's pretty good. Canada's there at nine or 10 and the European average is called at five. Um, so Canada has lots of wonderful climate related startups. There are debates in the United States over, over climate, whether it's real or not, over ESG. Thank God Canada is beyond that kind of uh, 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 childishness um, and is trying to address some of the more fundamental questions. <coughs> Um, like how do we address it? How do we take advantage of the opportunity? So the setup is wonderful, but there's a challenge beyond that positive setup, which is even though there's, there's a good venture environment in Canada, I would say that many people in this room are contributing to that. Uh, there's also a gap. I mean, there's a global gap when it comes to financing. Uh, once a company reaches a certain scale, uh, the opportunities that basically turns to, are you going to IPO? Are you going to get acquired? Are you going to raise a follow on from a US or some other uh, foreign fund? Because the growth equity landscape is, is pretty lean. It's not um, overflowing anywhere for climate companies, which tend to be more capital intensive because they're trying to transform big capital intensive parts of the economy. But it's a particularly uh, uh, interesting opportunity in Canada because we, we we over-index in terms of the number of these exciting growth companies, and we under-index in terms of the amount of capital going after it. So, boy, I mean, that smells like an investment opportunity to me. We certainly intend to launch a strategy to tackle that. We think we'll make excess returns. We're happy to do it. Um, it's a shame for, for the planet if uh, nobody goes after that. But I think those kind of vacuums call in uh, solutions. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good response. Go Canada. Yeah. That was an applause line. Well, yeah, exactly. I work at Canada Life, in case anyone was wondering. Canada Life. Yeah. Um, so I have, I really want to get to audience questions. And I was saying when I go to these panels and the moderator says, I want to get to audience questions, but please allow me to use the rest of the time to ask my questions <laughs> on my iPad. 
I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll take questions from the audience. And so I think there'll be microphones in either staircase if you'd like to ask a question. Um, both of you referenced the importance of partnerships in your mm -hmm. opening um, and the fact that this, this problem is so urgent, it needs all of us. Uh, can you talk about, you know, make that a bit more specific? What uh, this room of people in the investment community need to be thinking about or thinking differently about uh, if we're going to get, get this right? Um, so I think of partnerships in many different ways. Uh, it starts with Canadian companies and our exporters. So for me, there I need to be a true partner to them. I need to be someone that actually understands what it is they need to do and provide them solutions that actually work for them when they need it and be with them on their journey. So I need to look at myself as a partner, not someone that's just dictating. I have to really be a partner. I need to find partners like Power Sustainable, where we can actually build some private capital, start to mobilize private capital coming with us and us going together on a journey because that will actually have even more impact um, in the community. So I think um, certainly financial partners are very important. I also have to partner with other export credit agencies. I know that sounds really boring, but I do because I've got partners there. I've got there's international rules of trade. We need to move those forward. We've been spending a lot of time as Canada trying to move the climate sector understanding forward, which is the, how actually export credit agencies finance green projects to make sure that the tenor is right, that the pricing is right, and that there's a level playing field that Canadian companies can compete on the international stage. So that's a different type of partnership than the ones that um, perhaps many of you think about but again it comes back to it is a network and an ecosystem we all we won't be able to do this on their own and maybe to link to the question that i didn't answer uh, but i do think it's really important there's a particular group that we need to partner with and it's actually our carbon intense sectors and our emitters and our high emitters they are not going to get there if we just say this is black and white i'm an angel investor i'm investing in white green product maybe you should say green investor i have to think about the colors now but th that everything is great it's all it's all green financing if we don't convert the grid if we don't convert the industrial base we still won't have achieved anything. So, um, so for me, that's a really important partnership, which is how do we do transition financing to ensure that we become sustainable overall. And I, and I don't want to miss that point because when you ask what is a barrier, there's a really big cultural barrier out there, which is, you know, that anything that touches carbon intense sectors is bad yeah. by its nature and and that is not going to allow us to actually adjust what we need to adjust or actually to transition the canadian economy it cannot be either or it has to be and yeah. good takeaway owen you know i think marie has basically said it I'll, I'll just add one or two other thoughts um we're trying when you're trying to change a whole industry or a whole part of the economy, it's 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 very, very hard for, for a start. I mean, it's not like a, a piece of software that you can get your salespeople working on and and uh, start selling day one. Th let me let me come up with two or three examples. So a lot of people talk about the opportunities in hydrogen to decarbonize big chunks of the industrial economy or heavy transport. If you're a wonderful Canadian firm or a firm anywhere in the world that comes up with a magical system to convert water into hydrogen using green energy, and there's several of those companies, um, that's phenomenal. But for that to be really useful, you need off takers for that hydrogen. That, uh, that hydrogen also needs to get there somehow in pipelines. It can be corrosive and conventional um, um, conventional uh, uh, methane pipeline, pipelines. So now you've got a logistics challenge, you've got an off take challenge, and ultimately you need end users to start to sign up for it, but they'll be reluctant. Think about a trucking company, uh, uh, here in Quebec are companies that might be able to retrofit their uh, their um, uh, uh, inland waterways fleets or whatever it might be. Well, they'll be reluctant to undergo, undertake those investments if they're not sure that they'll be get, able to get adequate supply. So clean, clean, and clean investing, climate investing is full of these kind of chicken and egg challenges. Um, and you've got amazing early stage companies uh, growing quickly. Uh, that haven't had to tackle a lot of these challenges before and are trying to plug into whole networks and supply chains that are relatively new to them. 
um, parts of to, to sort of um, build on what uh, Marie was saying, you know, part of the traditional emitting economy, wh but where there's expertise, where there's um, a willingness and a pragmatism and a lot of know-how that we won't get there without understanding how to um, engage properly and bring solutions that really work in those sectors. Um, hydrogen is one, charging is an obvious one. Um, I, I could go down the list, things like cement, things like green steel, they're up and down those supply chains, uh, unless you've got willing uh, commercial participants, you know, because it's beyond just the, the sort of investment landscape, uh, willing commercial uh, participants, academic, uh, academic involvement um, to, to, to bring the, uh, the, some of the ideas to bear. Um, and bo both uh, Power Sustainable and, and EDC have been um, engaging the, uh, the Canadian academic community on these things as well. So um, these are tough, tough challenges. But there's lots of like-minded, uh, smart folks tackling different parts of the problem in their own spheres and bringing them all together is only in all our interest. David, can I can I just build on that and maybe give an example? And Owen and I were just talking about it earlier on uh, in the green room. Um, and it's Lion Electric. We mentioned yeah. it earlier on. And uh, it, it's a great example. So here you have an electric mobility. Um, at EDC, we've spent many, many years specializing in the automotive sector. And um, actually, we're very familiar with automotive toolers and the whole automotive supply chain. Um, but Lion Electric is looking where it should do its procurement and its sourcing. And we at EDC have a chance to not only introduce them to more traditional automotive suppliers but to under, so that the automotive suppliers themselves understand where the future is going so there's like a real when we talk about partnerships and your question who do you partner with it's not just the traditional well why don't we both co-invest together like we both have to do other things together. We have to help the companies we're investing in see a future that's different. We have to help their network. We have to use our networks to, to really drive forward change. So I think you have to be really creative. You're no longer just investing for a return. Um, you're actually investing for impact. Yeah. And that's a hugely different thing that we're doing. Yeah. That's great. Are there any questions from the audience? We have a few minutes left. One or two questions. Yes, I think there's a question up front here. Um, so first of all, a really compelling discussion. Thank you. A uh, really compelling discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I want to build on something both of you said. Uh, you know, we talked about how traditional VC funding is not maybe fit for purpose for this type of game changing, uh, you know, climate technology um, where the entire value chain has to be looked at. Um, you know, you talked about uh, the importance of the ecosystem. My question is on, you know, Canadian industrial policy, uh, and, and frankly, which hasn't really changed much since the Second World War, and, and I would argue isn't fit for purpose. How do you see that as, as a piece that helps to bring that together? Because the current models, I think, you know, from what you've been saying, are not going to be fit for purpose. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, I think Canadian industrial policy is a natural. Uh, for, <laughs> well, I, I can certainly opine. I, uh, yeah, so so uh, let me let me start by saying, like uh, at EDC, I think actions speak louder than words sometimes. So so we certainly recognise the point that you make, um, and and that's why we're being very clear about where we are putting our support into and where we see sectors of the future, where we see things going and how we see the ecosystem uh, being at play. But I think you're absolutely right. Policy really does matter. Industrial policy really matters. Environmental policy really matters. Policy is the framework by which people, people see the need to move forward. I think the fat, the first movers don't need policy, right? Policy and regulation is what brings the rest of the laggards along with them. So, so for me, if you're waiting on policy, you're going to be waiting for a while. Um, I, I think policy, you, you know, then everybody's in the game. It's too obvious, right? So I'd like us to be ahead of the game, and and that's where I see we can have uh, the real advantage. 
Um, but we do have to watch where policy is being made around the world. So the Inflation Reduction Act is an example of that, yeah. as is the European, um, the action that they have taken with their green, I've forgotten they've changed the name of it again, um, with their strategies. I, I think our most recent budget indicates where Canada's responding to that. But again, you have to have that base of uh, industrial policy at play. Look, that, I think that's that's basically it. I mean, I just say, look, there's there's kind of two two sides to the policy debate. One is creating the demand. I think Mairead's absolutely correct. That's to bring the laggards uh, up to speed. Um, but there'll be people who are ready to adopt, you know, even before policy kind of hits them over the head. Um, and there you're talking about things like carbon taxes yeah. are... Um, uh, uh, mandatory um, sustainability disclosures, for example, um, are uh, minimum um, or maximum amounts of green energy uh, and so forth. Um, but there is the, the sort of more early stage type of policy too. I mean, the Canada Growth Fund is a start there. Uh, there's there's all the work that EDC has been doing, you know, before it, it got fashionable. Um, <laughs> So there's... I love it. Yeah. Export credit agencies are fashionable. Well, That's awesome. A, a, a That's my curve. takeaway. <laughs> That's great. It's true. You know, it's <laughs> ahead of the curve. Um, and I think there, there's, there maybe is a little bit more that could be done. You know, I think one interesting thing is if you look at the, um, you know, where the capital goes, Canada's got an amazing and very mature and very sophisticated institutional investment um, uh, uh, ecosystem um, and community, one that, that is the envy of the world. And it is phenomenal. Um, but interestingly, though, they're, 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 they're world class. Um, but being world class, they by and large, with some noble exceptions, but by and large, they are looking globally um, and not particularly looking in their own backyard for those opportunities. It is interesting that, uh, you know, Canadian pension dollars are mostly looking at global opportunities. And, and I can tell you, the, the, the American pension dollars are certainly not flowing into Canada. So there, there's a kind of a gap there. Um, and that's something that is interesting. And I wonder if there's a way to try and tackle that a little bit. I don't know if it's just copying things like the IRA or, or the, the, the Euro various European green initiatives, but there might be a, an opportunity there beyond what we've seen already. Yeah. We're coming up to time. If there's one last question, if not, we'll do... No? Oh, yeah, over here. Oh, that was there. Thank you. Um, so comparing discussion, love it. Great moderator, um, very fun discussion. Um, just a question because it's very brave as an investor to finance the transition from brown to green, or invest or investing in low carbon solution or regenerative ag agriculture, because we know that the margin are lower than classical investments, or like the return on investment is not as high as some other investments. What do you think about the, the, the Canadian market or like the trust from LPs to, you know, to raise some funds saying that how do you communicate on your impact saying that you have to trust me on your investment because I will make some good? Like, do you have like specific uh, KPIs to promote your impact? Uh, I'm a, yeah, it's a really good question. So, um, you know, I go back to a point we were talking about earlier and that's the question of scale and how do you get to scale? Um, and you're absolutely correct. You take some green technologies, especially in things like agri-food, um, industrial, uh, they're not co cost competitive just yet uh, with generic um, uh, high carbon alternatives, uh, but they're getting there. Um, there are solutions that are rapidly approaching and, and will over time be uh, more economically efficient than the high carbon uh, alternatives. I'm not sure that the solution is to say, well, look, we're getting impact. And so we just bulldoze the capital in. I, I, I worry that that's ultimately not that scalable. You know, Power Sustainable, we're a full, full fat commercial operation. We're trying to attract capital from institutional investors uh, here and abroad. And they want a commercial return on, on, on their dollars. And I think if we really want to, in a capitalist economy, if we want to attract heavy duty trillions of dollars, the returns have to be competitive. So rather than say, We'll win by, you know, hitting them on the head until until um, our, our, we get enough capital and we just drive it through no matter what. Uh, we ask folks to take a haircut on their target returns. I think what you need to do is foster those nascent solutions that may not be fully cost competitive yet, but have early adopter buyers. Uh, 
and take them through the different um, venture investing stages, take them to, to growth equity, and they will get there and they will, uh, they will take take the commercial competition to the high, high emitting uh, alternatives and defeat them on their own turf. That's what I think we need to do. And once you can get there, once you can get to the, the equation of, you know, the green solution is actually more, more efficient and more cost competitive as well as being green, then the capital availability is uh, infinite and then you've, then you've won. And Solar. that's what I think we need to get to. Solar is a great example of that, right? For precisely, precisely. Hard to get it in at the, you know, 10 years ago. And today you don't, you know, you can't get into a solar deal and the returns are so small. Well, well exactly that. You know, it's a really good, I think what we need to do is we can't say, look, uh, the returns are kind of bad or, or we can only do 8% because it's, but it's, it's sustainable. I think we, we should get to the returns being bad and it's sustainable. I, I say bad by fully de-risking it yes, so that you go down that sort of the risk curve and the returns decline along with the risk um, and pension investors and institutional investors are delighted to make uh, six or seven or eight percent because it's fully de-risked and it's just part of the part of the plumbing part of the the, the deep infrastructure. I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to tell you a little secret having worked with Irish executives for a little while. They're very soft-spoken at the beginning what you just saw happen is their volume went up. So they were just getting they were just getting ready to get started. So there's a lot more here. There's a lot more to happen. I want to thank Owen and Marie for being here. If you can give them a round of applause, that would be just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.